Okay, so um, yeah, hi everyone, and uh, good morning, good evening, and good night. Uh, so thanks for staying up. Uh, for those of you uh, who are still staying up, a couple of people, I guess. Okay, so my talk is going to be about, um, I think, an interesting physics effect that uh, has been pointed out before, but maybe uh, not stressed enough. Uh, and I think it goes to some of the questions and discussion we've been having in, in this uh, conference about, you know, how do we know the composition of the neutron star? Uh, so definitely, you know, constraining the mass and radius is important. Um, or finding the mass and radius uh, more accurately, so to constrain the equation of state, uh, is a worthy goal. Uh, but ultimately, we also would like to know what's inside the neutron star. Uh, so that's what the G-mode um, oscillation, I think, is sensitive to. So I'll try to make the point um, as to how that happens. Um, I want to acknowledge the collaborators on this work, which has been going on for a couple of years. So there's uh, Thomas, uh, who we just heard from. Uh, and also a few excellent graduate students who are now on their way to PhD programs. Uh, that includes Megan Berry, Mark Salinas, and Brian Irving. Uh, and also we had a postdoctoral, um, sorry, a faculty, a visiting faculty doing her sabbatical with us a couple of years ago uh, who contributed to this. Okay, um, so before I get into the talk, I just want to say, uh, you know, I am one of the co-organizers, um, you know, of course, doing everything remotely, the bulk of the work has been done by um, the organizing team in India. Uh, but just, I'm, I just wanted to let you know that from the perspective of the International Steering Committee, uh, on which I am also, uh, I, you know, we definitely look forward to more exciting connections uh, and forging new connections uh, between the CSQCD community, which is really an open, uh, collaborative community that addresses you know, diverse topics in complex star physics and QCD. Uh, and we would like to form more connections with the uh, astrophysics community in India as well, and ICTS, of course. Uh, okay, so I think one of the advantages of sort of being or coming on towards the end of the um, uh, this conference is that many people have spoken and given excellent introductions. So I'll be kind of uh, fast with some of the introductory slides, but then I'll slow down once I get to the main points. Um, so we are firmly in the era of gravitational waves. Uh, you know, we've discovered. Uh, what's um, the lower five years now? Uh, we've seen gravitational waves and we're detecting. I mean, it's not a routine thing, but you know, will be in about five years or so. Um, but we kind of want to move beyond that and start using gravitational waves as a discovery tool. And we've always taken some you know, steps uh, in that regard. Uh, so, obviously, my focus is kind of coming from the nuclear physics side. Uh, Thomas spoke uh, you know, very nicely about. Um, you know, how one should look at quark degrees of freedom. Um, you know, there are ways to do it phenomenologically, but um, really we want to know, it's an exciting question to answer. Right? Can we have some sort of quark degrees of freedom emerge in a neutron star? Uh, and I think the G-mode oscillations can give us some kind of an answer. Um, maybe not, you know, immediately, but, uh, you know, these are related to gravitational waves and the history of gravitational waves is a long and illustrious one uh, and it's taken, you know, several decades to get here. Uh, so I think it's fine. We can wait another couple of decades to get to the answers, uh, but still theoretical investigations can of course continue in the meantime. Uh, so I'll talk specifically about the effects of quark matter on the G-mode oscillation spectrum. Um, and then I'll give a distinctly theoretical perspective on the observational outlook uh, for G-modes. Um, I think Paul mentioned in his talk that, you know, uh, regarding the FMOs that he's not going to bet his house. Uh, I think I would also, I, I would not you know, forget the house. I would not bet even a room in my house on that, uh, on finding G modes, uh, you know, very easily uh, because there's lots of other effects that can happen. Uh, but again, I think the impetus is there. Um, and if you look in the right place and, you know, keep persisting, I think we can find some interesting um, signals there. Okay, so um, again, since there's been a lot of uh, excellent introductions, I think I can be kind of rapid with this part here. Uh, you know, gravitational waves have been, of course, detected and, and given us a lot of information. Uh, some of them are listed here, as you can see. Uh, the focus, of course, in, in this conference is kind of looking at neutron star radii and EOS constraints uh, from tidal polarizability um, extracted from the waveform. We know kind of what the range of neutron star radii is now. Uh, NICER is, of course, also helping with that, although the, uh, you know, they're kind of going in a little bit of opposite directions, but they're at least mutually consistent. Uh, and also there's implications for cosmology and particle physics. So really gravitational waves have 
delivered on their promise uh, and more. Um, and we've also seen this uh, slide in, in various forms in different talks. So, you know, what's inside the neutron star? Here's this kind of onion skin picture here. Uh, we've seen several uh, times before. And, you know, I haven't shown the atmosphere and envelope, which is, was very important in determining the spectra of neutron stars from which we can extract information on radii and so on. Um, but, you know, we want to look in the guts. So we would say, you know, there's an outer crust uh, and that's about 200 meters. Uh, this is typically a density is less than neutron drift. And here we would expect some kind of nuclear lattice. So some uh, kind of, uh, you know, ions um, of nuclei. And uh, it, gravity is pretty strong, of course. Um, so you have stratification. And so you would expect um, that at certain level uh, or certain depth, you have a certain kind of nucleus in equilibrium with, uh, uh, you know, in statistical equilibrium. Uh, if you go in further in, uh, then you have the inner crust, which is, uh, you know, can take you up to saturation densities. Um, and here you have neutron rich nuclei and neutrons start to, to drip out. Uh, and then in the outer core, uh, you get a, up to about two times saturation, you get all these interesting, uh, you know, pasta phases, which can uh, affect transport significantly. Um, and then you have sort of a, a Fermi liquid uh, of neutrons and protons. Uh, and you also have some leptons like electrons and neurons. You could have superfluidity as well, but I won't talk about that in this talk. Uh, and then as you go further in, of course, things get really, really uncertain. So beyond about, you know, two solar, uh, two, um, uh, two times saturation uh, and going beyond that, we don't really know what's in there. Um, you know, exotic species like quarks could enter. How they enter, uh, there's different models for that, as uh, Thomas mentioned. Um, there's also a recent suggestion that you could have something like quarkionic matter, which one can think of as a phase transition momentum space. Uh, so in this case, you have some kind of the quarks come in, but they form a Fermi gas. Um, and then deep inside the Fermi sphere, the low momentum uh, scattering interactions are blocked, poly blocked. But on the surface, you can still allow that. And so you might have a, a thin shell of baryons at the surface of the quark Fermi sphere. Um, and that can lead to interesting behavior in uh, things like the speed of sound. Uh, which is relevant to neutron stars. So we'll talk a little bit about that later. Okay, so the QCD phase diagram. Um, of course, again, you've seen variations of this. Um, so I just want to point out again that, uh, you know, studying neutron stars, again, this is the main motivation, is that it's in this uh, density regime where we're far, far away from where PQCD can be applied. Uh, in fact, even heavy ion collisions, uh, you know, our initial uh, idea of applying uh, just a free uh, quark and gluon gas did not uh, uh, bear out. Uh, it turns out to be kind of a strongly interacting liquid um, with a very low eta over s and so on, uh, with interesting physics of its own. Um, so something similar like that, you know, has uh, is really needed. I think these non perturbative approaches and taking QCD seriously is the way to go if you want to take quark seriously. Um, so, uh, of course, my perspective is a little bit different. I kind of will just talk about more about thermodynamics in this talk. Uh, not so much about the details of the models and so on. Okay, so G mode oscillation is a kind of stellar oscillation, neutrons, um, not just in neutron stars, but others as well. So uh, the theory of stellar oscillations is, uh, you know, pretty general. It was de developed by uh, several people, starting, I think, with, uh, with the Cox in the 1930s, and then several people have contributed to that. Uh, Chandrasekhar, for example, has uh, made several uh, contributions. Uh, so why study these things? Um, well, one thing, one reason I can point to um, is, you know, look at the information that we've got by studying these oscillations from the sun. So we have, um, you know, helioseismology is a very active field of astrophysics. Uh, we have these well-known five-minute um, oscillations of the surface of the sun measured by just the Doppler shift um, of the um, spectral lines obtained from the surface. Um, and by Making careful measurements of these, we've uh, determined many things about uh, the sun. Uh, so one of the things, for example, if it's an independent verification of how old it is. Uh, it's about 4.6 billion years. Uh, and one can determine that essentially by uh, looking at the speed of sound. Uh, so the oscillations depend on the sound speed, which in turn depends on the composition, specifically the helium to hydrogen ratio. Uh, and since we know the primordial heat, uh, heat to H ratio from, from the Big Bang, um, and stars are, you know, gradually burning hydrogen to helium. Uh, the, this ratio is a little bit different than primordial, and essentially by having that ratio measured in the sun or extracted from measurements of the oscillations, 
uh, one can find this estimate, which is inconsistent with uh, other things. Um, and also neutrino oscillations. So helioseismology basically confirmed our sort of standard solar model. Uh, there was really nothing wrong with that, um, although it still continues to be checked. Um, and so that was important to sort of rule out that possibility uh, when we we're looking at the neutrino deficit. So now we know, of course, that neutrinos do oscillate. Uh, and then because that's sort of one that that's sort of our nearest star uh, but then you know you can also look at distant stars so uh, we have sort of the prototypical variable stars called the cephids um, and here the uh, the luminosity uh, varies with the period in a uh, in a definite way uh, so there's a correlation between the absolute luminosity uh, the apparent luminosity and the period uh, but then one can also explain the this change as resulting from um, changes in the absolute luminosity driven by uh, something called the kappa mechanism, which involves uh, the change of uh, opacity as a function um, uh, of helium ionization. So basically knowing the, uh, the mechanism that causes fluctuations in the absolute luminosity and a measurement of the apparent luminosity, which correlates with simply the period, uh, one can determine the distance to these cephids, and that serves as a um, standard candle on, um, therefore you can gauge sort of one rung on the cosmic distance ladder. So uh, that's important for cosmology as well. So bottom line is we've you know, learned a lot of things uh, just by studying stellar oscillations. Uh, and these are you know, regular sort of main sequence or evolved stars, uh, not compact stars. And, uh, but one can also go and look at compact stars. So white dwarfs, there have been some um, uh, you know, confirmations of um, oscillation modes, but in neutron stars, there's nothing firmly detected yet, but that's kind of what we're looking to. Okay, so can we use gravitational waves to tell uh, the composition of a neutron star, not um, just mass and radius? Um, so I will, um, not in any detail, but I'll kind of try to sketch what the theory of um, uh, stellar oscillations is. So it, it's fairly general. So uh, some of these equations, although simplified, will still hopefully give you some idea of uh, how we uh, make our way to determining an oscillation mode. Okay, um, so you know, if one, if one wants to do sort of a full, full-on numerical treatment, um, that's sort of not my style uh, either. But you know, one can certainly do it. But it's a heavily computational problem. But I'm going to make these simplifications where I assume that it's a non-rotating star. Uh, no magnetic field and temperature. So turning on all these things is going to make make it very complicated, um, and you know we'll we'll make the uh, computation also very intensive. So uh, I think sometimes the simplest physics can be extracted by looking at the simplest cases. So uh, let's proceed in that with that philosophy. Uh, so one can write down sort of um, oops, excuse me, go back here. So one can write down the uh, the fluid displacement um, in terms of uh, so it's a vector, and uh, so it has sort of three components. One can decompose it into a radial component and uh, an angular component. And so these are sort of the, the psi r and the psi h are the amplitudes of those components. And then you have uh, the components themselves are you know decomposed here in terms of these unit vectors r theta phi. Uh, and these are spheroidal modes. So it was sh shown shown long ago by uh, Kip Thorne that you can um, in zero rotation limit you have this decom decomposition in terms of parity. So you have either even parity oscillations, which are called spheroidal, or odd parity, which is called toroidal. Uh, so the even parity ones are uh, you know, functions of these spherical harmonics here. In particular, the derivatives go like this. Anyway, so, excuse me, being a trigger happy here. Okay. Um, and then, of course, one should do this in GR for compact stars. But again, uh, for simplicity uh, of illustration, I'm just going with Newtonian. So you have some displacement uh, of the fluid. Uh, we don't worry about where it comes from at the moment. Let's just say somehow it happens. Um, but then this fluid, of course, would be subject to the same kind of laws that the equilibrium fluid was subject to, which means the equation of continuity and the Euler equation. Again, you're talking Newtonian here. Um, and then the Poisson equation, if you're only Newtonian gravity, uh, and then uh, an energy conservation equation. Uh, so if you neglect the back reaction of the fluid perturbation on the gravitational potential, that's commonly known as the Cowling approximation. Uh, and it has variance in both the Newtonian formalism and the, uh, the GR formalism. Um, so again, one can attack the 
you know, the problem of these oscillation modes in Newtonian gravity, of course, keep in mind, there are no gravitational waves in Newtonian gravity. So um, you can maybe get an estimate of the oscillation frequency, but you cannot actually connect it to, um, you know, the gravitational waves with any uh, great confidence. So, but it's a first step. Okay, so having uh, established that perturbation and then subjecting it to those perturbation equations, uh, you get in some linearized approximation, you would get some differential equations. And um, to solve those, you would need boundary conditions. So in a star, typically, you know, the simplest case you could imagine, of course, there's the center where you, the solutions should be regular, uh, where R goes to zero. So, you know, you have to make sure things don't blow up there. And then you have the surface uh, where you assume that it's, it's, the surface is free. So you can even uh, perturb the surface, but of course the, the perturbation um, should um, identically vanish at that surface. So, so the surface can deform as well, uh, but there the Lagrangian variation of the pressure should go to zero. Uh, and then of course the neutron star has all these layers. So uh, you know, one layer is the core crust interface where the crust is, uh, uh, is solid or at least has a large uh, shear modulus. Um, and so in that case, you will have boundary conditions also at that point. So you have to include what's called the traction, uh, which is related to the, um, the Cauchy stress tensor of uh, whatever kind of um, uh, lattice or structure you have in the crust here. Um, so I'm just showing this again just for illustration, but the, the procedure is essentially that you perturb the equations um, and you look for, you, know, you linearize it, and then you look for oscillatory solutions. Um, based, uh, that satisfies certain boundary conditions. So that's the name of the game. So um, let me go back here for a second. So in the Euler equation you see here, you have you know, uh, several terms here. So you have a, a grad P prime, um, and then you'll have a grad phi naught. So there's different kinds of restoring forces. So the Euler equation is basically, you can think of it as a Newton's law of motion for the fluid. And on the right-hand side, you can have more terms than this. So if the, if the star is rotating, you'll have a Coriolis force. Um, so it's not that one mode exists in isolation. Several, all these restoring forces act together, uh, but people, uh, or at least it's, it's not standard practice to solve everything in full glory. Normally what one does is focus on a particular uh, driving term. So let's say you're focused on um, G mode oscillations, you would be looking at the buoyancy restoring force. If you're looking at R modes, you'd be looking at the Coriolis term and so on. So um, based on that sort of simplification, one can come up with certain classifications. So there are the types of modes that one normally talks about. Uh, so you have the F modes, um, which are a kind of, uh, there's, no, there's no nodes uh, for the F mode inside the star. Um, and it's a non-radial oscillation. Uh, and it's, most people believe that it's the one most likely to couple to gravitational waves and, and get excited um, to the highest amplitude. So uh, Devarati mentioned this in her talk that this is uh, probably the most promising one that uh, people are focused on. And the typical range of that is about one to three kilohertz. Uh, and the frequency itself is sort of determined uh, by what the, you know, what the restoring force is. It's also important to know what kind of stellar property it probes. So, um, the F mode probes the mean density of the star. The P mode um, is slightly higher frequency, well above current gravitational wave detector sensitivities. Uh, this one probes the sound speed. It'd be nice to have some information on that. Um, and then the G modes, as they've been studied so far, with, where the restoring forces buoyancy are low frequency modes. This is again, perhaps a little too low for, um, for advanced LIGO, but this is also interesting because it, um, uh, basically looks at or is sensitive to things like a like the convective gradient and I'll show later there's another kind of G modes that basically um, can be used to determine the composition um, again there's layers between there's layers inside neutron stars so you can have shear forces between those layers again these are um, typically very small uh, but still they could be uh, they could couple to um, sort of electromagnetic uh, flares and so on so they have been um, sort of identified as possible excitations um, in, in sort of torsional oscillations and things like that of the crust. Uh, R modes, of course, uh, I'm pretty sure everyone has heard of that. That's um, related to, to uh, a certain instability that arises in rotating neutron stars only. Uh, it's in the frequency range of LIGO. And to have these kind of R modes, um, you know, one could look at 
systems like accreting um, uh, pulsars or, uh, or accreting neutron stars, or one could look at um, just isolated stars that are spinning down, but hopefully are uh, fairly young, that the R mode instability hasn't completely died down. Um, but it sort of needs perhaps continuous wave observations. So as of now, you know, there are targets identified, but that's a very uh, compute intensive task to really look at one object, you know, as a continuous wave source for a long time uh, and try to identify hopefully um, an R mode signature. Right now, the focus is obviously on looking at the most violent but transient events like mergers. Uh, but the R mode would be sensitive to viscosity. So the interesting thing is like the F mode, which is the most sort of, you know, likely to or getting the most attention is only sensitive to something like the mean density. Several equations of state can give you, uh, you know, the same mean density. Uh, so I, I think, again, this point was made before in an earlier talk that the F mode is not a very sensitive discriminator uh, between different equations of state. Uh, whereas some of these other things like G modes, um, P modes, and R modes are sensitive really to the composition. So unfortunately, they are either in frequency bands that are not um, in the domain of current detectors, and also they're not likely to be excited um, to very high amplitudes. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's still interesting to look at those. So this is just a quick graph showing you that the F and G modes are where they fit in the uh, sensitivity curve. Uh, this is not the latest one, but it's kind of pretty close to what the current sensitivities are. So if you want to look at that, you can go to this link here. Um, I'm showing the R modes here because, you know, their origin is a little bit different. Uh, like I said, they might be seen in isolated systems or maybe accreting systems. Um, but as far as, let's say, you know, mergers are concerned, uh, which is sort of where gravitational waves are looking right now, there is the F mode uh, and the G mode. So they're kind of in these opposite um, ends, so not really in this bucket here, but um, you know, here you have uh, you know, seismic noise here interfering, shock noise here interfering with this. Um, but again, if we can improve the sensitivity and keep doing that, then hopefully we can address or try to find these modes. <coughs> okay, um, so that was Newtonian, but one has to do general relativity. Um, so if you assume the star does not rotate, um, I'm going to assume that we have the spherically symmetric background. So you have the short style metric. Uh, this is the interior metric, so inside the star. And then, um, again, you would have to do metric perturbations. But metric perturbations, again, would have to obey the equations of motion, which are Einstein's equations. So when one does this, one finds uh, five nonlinear, strongly nonlinear coupled PDEs inside the star. Uh, it reduces to only a system of two PDEs outside. Still, it's a computationally intensive problem to solve this. Um, now, for the, the, the techniques to solve this, some of them do kind of transplant between uh, black holes and neutron stars. So Chandrasekhar and Detweiler showed in 1975, uh, while they were actually making a study of oscillation modes of black holes, um, that uh, these are the axial modes. So again, not directly relevant to the um, F and G modes, which are, which are spheroidal. Uh, but still, they show that one can um, make a, if you're only interested in the oscillation frequency um, and the damping time, there are ways to sort of do that in a simpler way. So they um, juggle the equations around to drive something called the Zerilli equation um, outside the star, where you can see that it kind of resembles um, a Schrodinger equation. So there's, you know, if you think of Z as a wave function, there's D2 psi over dr squared plus uh, energy, but energy is going like omega squared, not omega, uh, minus some potential times psi equals zero. Um, our star here is the uh, tortoise coordinate that basically um, is a better coordinate to use in dealing with the event horizon. Um, so one can essentially find the quasi-normal modes uh, by looking at this equation just as a simple uh, you know, 1D Schrodinger equation, and you're solving it for scattering uh, from a potential that only depends on R, so it's a central potential. Uh, and so then one can, of course, draw on the several methods that one knows from quantum mechanics and do this. So methods like this can be applied to a neutron star as well, with the additional complication that there is, of course, matter inside the neutron star. So for a black hole, you don't need to solve anything inside. Uh, but for the neutron star, you do. Uh, and you have to match boundary conditions and so on. It can be done. Um, so I will now show some results. Of course, since there is matter inside the neutron star, uh, you need to choose an equation of state. So um, the equation of state I'm, I'm showing here, uh, there's several of them here. 
So uh, these aren't chosen because they're the best equations of state or you know, even that they meet all kind of observational constraints. I'm just choosing, choosing a variation because I want to study the variation uh, in the oscillation modes as a function of different equations of state. So <clears throat> for the uh, quark matter equation of state, uh, you know, just a simple sort of thermodynamic bag model um, as explained by Thomas. Uh, and one can add sort of something like a current quark mass of about 100 MeV or so for the strange quark, keep the light quarks massless, uh, and then add some perturbative corrections. Um, and then for the nuclear side, uh, there's again different, one, different ones chosen. Uh, so this you know, relativistic mean field models, and we chose uh, for the purposes of our work the uh, skirm lyon uh, equation of state, which basically um, is based on the work of Hansel and Pichon uh, and a few others that sort of try to uh, use the same, same basic equation of state to describe everything from crust to the core rather than just patching different equations of state. Um, it turns out to be quite an issue to get thermodynamic consistency if you um, just you know, patch one equation of state over the other. Um, so they've addressed issues like that. Um, I do want to point out that you know, just, just because you have certain equations of state that don't seem to meet observational constraints, uh, it doesn't mean one should really rule them out. So we don't know what, how the composition might change, right? So there might be a phase transition that sort of uh, you know, softens these things, makes, their, makes radii of these uh, high mass stars more in line, um, or even the 1.4 um, solar mass star may have a radius that's sort of more consistent. So even if something is stiff, for example, um, you know, one should give it a second thought. Uh, so for example, there's a recent pap paper by, um, one of the participants here, uh, Duhin Malik, who talked about, you know, admixing dark matter along with the NL3 equation of state and showed how that would be, uh, bring the measurement of, bring the radius measurement into line uh, with the polarizability measurement. So, um, yeah, so basically the, the message here is, you know, I've chosen a diverse equation, range of equation of state. I'm not sort of judging them. I'm just using them to see what the variation is on the F mode. Okay. So here are the results for uh, the F mode for those equations of state. Uh, and again, Deborah showed, I think the F mode uh, variation is a function of the effective mass. Here, um, all I'm doing is just choosing different equations of state that I showed in the previous graph. Um, and what you see here is on the vertical axis is the frequency of the F mode. This is calculated in full GR. Uh, so basically that method that I described. And then, uh, here we have the, the mass. So basically what you see is um, if we go with pure strange stars, uh, again, no comment on whether they can exist or not, but just, you know, if we go with such a model, uh, we see that their F modes are pretty much constant. Again, not, it's not surprising because the F mode is a probe of the mean density of the star. The mean density of something like you know, a strange quark star really doesn't change much uh, throughout its uh, profile. So basically um, it's going to be have the same F mode, okay? And it, it's relatively high, so about uh, over 2.2 uh, kilohertz. Um, and then if you look at the neutron stars, uh, so the NL3, for example, here, but if you choose a different uh, parameterization of the mean field, uh, mean field theory, you get something here. Uh, and then for hybrid stars, you get something that kind of, you know, interpolates between neutron stars, uh, between the frequency of neutron stars at low mass. Of course, once you have the phase transition, then um, it starts to sort of, look more like the quark matter result here. So the F mode kind of interpolates between, uh, for hybrid stars, interpolates between the results for neutron stars um, and pure quark stars. So, you know, talking about smoking guns in the last talk, if one sort of, you know, ideally was able to detect an F mode frequency in, in sort of the two, two and a half range uh, for a 1.5 solar mass um, uh, neutron star, it would probably, you know, one could argue that it has to have, you know, be a, either a pure strange star or at least, you know, if it's a little bit heavier, should have some amount of, uh, could have some quark matter in them. But again, here, it's not so clear because there's still quite a bit of variation, um, uh, you know, depending on your choice of the hadronic equation of state. Um, and so one can't really say too much, I think, uh, about the equation of state based on the F mode. Uh, I should point out that there's been um, a recent paper where uh, Tanya Hinder and uh, collaborators looked at um, the effect, well, they kind of looked at the waveform and then chose some priors uh, on modeling the F mode and uh, extracted a lower bound on the F mode um, on the fundamental as well as its first overtone. Uh, 
but the fundamental one basically is larger than they according to them is larger than 1.4 kilohertz that's extracted from the from 170817 uh, so that doesn't really help us too much since uh, as you can see here um, we already have something like 1.8 kilohertz here so uh, it's good to know that it's consistent with the calculations that we're doing but you know, if, if this bond was able, if we were able to raise this uh, a bit higher, then that would be useful. Okay. Um, now, if we did detect F modes in advanced LIGO, um, you know, because its its frequency range is really not not going up as high as uh, you know, two and three kilohertz or so. At least it's not that sensitive in that in that band. So, if we were able to detect a clean signal at some point, it's probably suggesting that. Um, we're detecting F modes of neutron stars or perhaps hybrid stars. Uh, but if we detected them in sort of these, you know, cryogenic detectors, which are um, currently trying to uh, lower their sensitivity, I, I don't think they're anywhere near um, where the interferometer, interferometers are. Um, but, you know, in the distant future, if they did achieve sensitivity that is required to detect some of these modes, um, because they're in a higher region, then, you know, only quark stars would be able to give a signal there. Um, so when I when I heard Paul talk about Nemo, I think I, I was uh, very excited about that because I think if there's a way to get um, to work in sort of this one to three or two to three uh, kilohertz region and really get the sensitivities you know down to where we can detect these modes, then uh, we can start to answer this question. So I think that's a very um, it's an effort worth pursuing to build these kind of detectors. Uh, let it, I mean, besides the fact that the cost is pretty uh, low. Okay, so um, let me go to the G mode. Uh, let's check the time here for a second. Okay. Yeah, so probably should speed up here. Um, so we've, let me just briefly talk about um, the, the G modes uh, before I give the results, because I think I have to speed up a little bit here. I should not have spent so much time on the previous slides. But okay, so um, what is the G mode? So essentially, if you consider, you know, there's a lot of stratification in the neutron stars. If you consider some blob of matter that has a certain pressure and density here, and in equilibrium with its surroundings. Somehow, if it finds itself in an environment where its uh, pressure and density now, um, you know, it, it keeps, it doesn't change it that much. So it goes up a little bit. Uh, now, it'll find itself in a region where the pressure and density is a little bit different because of the stratification. So let's say outside it's P prime and rho prime. Uh, then the density, you know, cannot adjust that fast. Okay, so the composition cannot change and therefore the density cannot change that fast, but pressure can equilibrate faster through just uh, acoustic waves. So you have, a re you have a situation where this blob which came from below has a slightly higher density than the matter around it and therefore will sink back. Consequently, if, it's, uh, you know, if it was under dense, then it would sort of bounce back. Uh, and so as long as you don't have convection, which you don't in cold neutron stars, um, you would have oscillations back and forth. So again, we're not answering the question of what is causing this displacement. It could be, you know, tides from mergers, uh, but essentially uh, this is the mechanism of the G mode. So essentially you would have, it's buoyancy related. One can run through some equations to essentially calculate what the, the period is. It's related to something called the brunt weissalder frequency. Uh, and there's a simpler uh, or a more transparent way to write this brunt weissalder frequency. Uh, so this is just uh, some examples of G modes. If you look up at clouds, for example, you've probably seen this kind of pattern, um, and that's essentially related to the interplay of winds with, uh, with the cloud pattern. But it's, again, oscillations caused by buoyancy. Uh, I think I'll skip this one here. Yeah, I'll go to this one where, um, so another way to rewrite the brunt weissalder frequency is in terms of the difference of two sound speeds. Uh, so one is the equilibrium sound speed, which is the one that everyone sort of computes and make, makes a big deal about. So this is just dpd epsilon at equilibrium. So if you have an equilibrium pressure energy curve, you just you know, take the derivative at a certain point, uh, and that's what you get. So the composition at every stage is the equilibrium composition at that density. Uh, CS squared is something called the adiabatic sound speed. So um, this is dpd epsilon, or more accurately, the partial derivative of p with respect to epsilon, keeping all compositions fixed. So if the blob moves and, and displaces, but is not able to change its composition, um, then there's another sound speed associated with that, so which tries to equilibrate the composition. And that's the sound speed called the adiabatic sound speed. Um, so what's the difference between the two? One can calculate this. So one can do dpd epsilon just from a pressure energy equilibrium curve, but one can also calculate dpd epsilon, keeping the composition fixed. And what you get is you see, um, just I'm choosing the APR 
the familiar equation of state. Um, it's a parametrized one. It's not um, the microscopic one, but it's just a, it's something that's parametrized to fit that microscopic model. Uh, there's a parameter there which controls the stiffness, uh, and that's set to 0.2. So if you don't have muons, um, and that'll be important later, I'll show you the difference when you have muons and don't. So if there's no muons, let's say just neutrons, protons, electrons, you see C square, C square are almost the same with some slight difference. Okay, uh, not too interesting. Um, but what does happen with muons, I'll come to that in a bit. Um, actually, let me go there first, I'll come back to this. But if you do have muons in there, okay, again, C square and C square, if you plot them independently, they look very close. But what you see here is the difference of them uh, shows a spike, right, where you have the muon threshold. So just when muons come in, the difference between the two sound speed shows a, a marked rise, which means the brunt Solar frequency changes sharply, which means the G mode frequency is going to change sharply. Therefore, we have a, an oscillation mode that is clearly sensitive to, to composition. It can tell you the difference, just theoretically speaking, between having muons and not having muons. So what does composition um, you know, kind of depend on? So in, sort of this, in, in a simple model, if you have just neutrons, protons, electrons, you can rewrite this um, difference of sound speeds also in terms of the proton fraction uh, and several derivatives of the symmetry energy. So it's quite sensitive, not just to the symmetry energy, but also its derivatives, right? Um, which is not unfortunately constrained at high density, but that could actually be a good thing because if you do make measurements of G modes, that might tell you something about these high deriv derivatives at high density. Um, and so these derivatives are related to things like, uh, uh, at least at saturation, things like the you know L parameter and J parameter and so on, we, which we have constraints for. Um, and so we know something about what the brunt solar frequency should be um, around nuclear saturation, but we do not know what it should be at higher densities. And everything everything matters because the brunt solar frequency is a local frequency. CE, C, CE and CS are functions of the density. Um, and the message is again that it's you know it's sensitive to composition. So with muons, uh, the brunt solar frequency sort of looks like this, uh, sorry, without muons. So you see a peak, then it falls off. Uh, the peak here is coming from the core crust interface. I've assumed here that the crust basically is kind of a one component fluid uh, and therefore has no compositional dependence. Obviously untrue, but um, this is simplification because the crust is kind of hard to deal with, uh, but one can do it eventually. Um, and then with muons, again, you see the distinct bump when the muons come in. Okay, and then one can calculate the G mode frequency by solving uh, sort of the global oscillation modes once you know the local brunt solar frequency. Uh, and then you find that in homogeneous phases at least, such as these, uh, you get something like um, a G mode of about 100 hertz. Okay, but again, the main message here is that um, it is sensitive to composition. So a star with, with or without muons uh, would have a different G mode frequency. How much? We'll see in a bit. Okay, um, the next thing, of course, we're looking for quarks is, you know, how does sound propagate in a mixed phase? Um, so how does sound, sound do that? How does uh, sound propagate in, in a, well, let's look at a simple example. So if you have, uh, this is a work from uh, about 10 years ago where they looked at a simple experiment where you pass um, air bubbles through water. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, similar to what one might have in a neutron star where you have, let's say, bubbles of one phase uh, inside another. Uh, and if you look at the sound speed of the mixture, you see essentially that as you introduce bubbles into the mixture, the compressibility, uh, the system becomes much more compressible because it's much easier to compress uh, those bubbles, but you don't change the density a lot by just introducing a few bubbles. And therefore uh, the compressibility, it becomes more compressible and uh, therefore the sound speed falls, but then it goes back up once the system is mostly in the void phase. Uh, one can use this idea and apply this to a neutron star, except it's not as simple. So there's two conserved charges in, uh, in a system, uh, like a neutron star. So you have electric charge and baryon number. Uh, so it's not just air and water. Um, but again, one can do a, we don't sort of blindly apply this formula, but uh, essentially we can carry out the analysis. What we see is that the equilibrium sound speed, which depends on the derivative of the baryon chemical potential as well as the uh, charge chemical potential, the charge chemical potential ends up being um, uh, not continuous. And so you get um, this change in the sound speed when you have a mixed phase. Uh, so we did some recent calculations here. 
so we took a recent nuclear equation of state presented by uh, Zhao and Latimer. And uh, for the nuclear equations of state, so this equation of state basically looks at a lot of the current constraints um, and also microscopic constraints on, um, uh, on symmetric nuclear matter and uh, neutron matter, uh, but also looking at other things like constraints with polarizability. Uh, so we chose that for the nuclear equation of state. For the quark equation of state, we chose something called the VMIT model, which is kind of in the class of the VBAC models that um, Thomas talked about. Uh, so what happens in the mixed phase is something similar. So if you look at CS square and CE square, uh, the mixed phase actually, uh, here you see quite a drastic difference. So you can identify, in fact, the start of the mixed phase very clearly because CE square shows a jump, but CS squared is not. So one is continuous and the other one uh, shows this jump here. And so the sound speed difference again um, shows that, shows that um, jump here. And as before, this is gonna affect uh, the G modes. So here you have uh, just the mass and radius of uh, these different equations of state. So the nuclear equation of state of Jean Latimer gives you the blue curve. So it goes over two solar masses. The pure quark equation of state is too soft. Uh, the mixed phase does not quite get you there, but again, I've chosen parameters that are, that are soft. I can easily stiffen this using different set of parameters and get this higher. Uh, but again, the message is not, the message is really that um, if you see a change in the, in the mass radius curve, or even if it's, if it's not that sensitive, right? So this is not a huge difference, might be hard to pin down. Uh, the G mode shows a drastic jump. So because the phase transition, uh, because the sound speed or the difference of sound speed has that jump and that translates into the G mode difference. You see that right when the mixed phase enters, uh, you will see a jump in the G mode frequency. Uh, and the interesting thing here that makes it, I think, um, uh, different from the F modes is that the G mode frequency is actually higher than both the neutron star and the quark uh, phase. So the colors are a little bit off here. So this, the lower one should be the quark and this one is the neutron. But in the F mode, we saw how the introduction of the mixed phase basically interpolates between neutron star F modes and quark star F modes. In this case, it goes way above either of them. Okay, so there's a potential, it's not gonna be as confusing. So if you see a G mode that's high frequency, then it's definitely a sign of a mixed phase. So we looked at this in some other models as well. Um, so in the previous graph sort of, you know, you might argue, well, there's a distinction here and there's a, corresponding distinction here, but we can find parameters where, um, you know, we can camouflage the phase transition. So we can look at parameter spaces um, derived from uh, those models that Thomas talked about, you know, where you have uh, additional back constants coming from current symmetry breaking and so on. Uh, and we can tweak parameters so that even with a phase transition, the mass and radii look very, very similar for neutron stars and hybrid stars. But even in these cases, you see a distinct change in the speed of sound and therefore the brin by solar frequency. Uh, and so there's a distinctive signature of a continuous phase transition. Even if it's not there in the mass radius curve, uh, it will be there um, in the G mode oscillation frequency because the brin by solar frequency again shows this distinct peak when the mixed phase enters. So I'm kind of coming towards the end of my time, so I'll, I'll try to wind up. Um, so improving the constraints on radii to, you know, uh, obviously the nicer measurements and we have now uh, limits from the polarizability as well uh, is of course extremely useful and these efforts should continue and, and uh, it tells us a great deal. Um, but, you know, if we answer sort of simple questions like can, can quark matter exist in neutron stars? Like can these observations be explained by hybrid stars? And um, you'll see that, yes, uh, you can still have um, models where, you know, one or both components could be hybrid stars, could have some quark matter in them. Um, so I think this situation will not be answered by, you know, improving measurements. So one needs some sort of clean signature, which is hard to get. Um, but one possibility could be looking at these G modes, because it's clear that even when mass and radii are very, very, very similar, I mean, one, you know, you saw on that graph that probably you'll never get the precision necessary um, to distinguish, um, you know, between mass, just on the base of mass and radii, because you can always find parameters that camouflage the phase transition. But um, for 
G modes, um, you can see that it's, you know, once you have a, a mixed phase coming in, oops, excuse me. Once you have a mixed phase coming in, you see that the G mode frequencies in, is definitely much higher. So if you have like a, a heavy star that shows a G mode that's about you know, 0.8 kilohertz or something, that can only be a hybrid star. It cannot be a neutron star. Uh, and you, know, you can't have G modes higher than this. So the, the stiffer you make it, the lower the G modes go. And this is already a fairly stiff equation of state uh, because you need to get two solar masses. So um, that way you know that you know, if, you, if you were to build neutron star equations of state that get you to two solar masses, the G modes are going to be always in this range here. So if you saw something much higher that had to have exotic matter in it. So is it a clean signature? Well, uh, you know, for a theorist, yes, but obviously uh, the observational outlook is very different. I don't claim to, um, uh, you know, really make a strong statement here or anything, but um, I just want to say that, you know, we've already learned so much from observations of uh, the binary merger. We could not have imagined that we could have learned so much, let's say 20, 30 years ago. So who knows in, you know, looking forward over the same time scale, um, what all we'll be able to uncover. Um, so anyway, most of you are familiar with this. I won't belabor the point. Um, but what a theorist can do is sort of, you know, try to do a serious job. And, uh, you know, yes, we know what the G mode frequency is. And, okay, I've mentioned that it could be a kind of a smoking gun. But then one thing we don't know is we don't know the amplitude of these oscillations, nor do we know the damping time. So we can, can compute the damping time. So um, here are some estimates, which, uh, again, I've just put on formula here. But the, the aim of calculating these things is to ultimately find out uh, whether the G mode can be, become unstable in some window. Because if it's unstable, it will grow uh, and then contribute to um, a strong gravitational wave. So it can be driven unstable. The upshot is it can be driven unstable in a certain temperature range that possibly can be reached in mergers. It's perhaps a little bit high, you know, can be reached in certain parts of it. Um, and for rotational frequencies that are, you know, fairly large. So, um, Again, these rotational frequencies may have to be somewhat, uh, have to be pretty fast. Uh, the detection prospects, again, uh, you know, one can make a, just a crude estimate. So here's a, um, a study that basically looked at um, detecting F modes in eccentric uh, in spiraling binaries. So if you make a model of the waveform that includes F modes, you see that you accumulate some phase shift. Justin talked about this as well in our talk. So one can make a similar calculation for the G modes, um, get a typical estimate for the accumulated phase shift, which only you know, happens right um, uh, like a few tens of milliseconds before the merger. Um, and then compare it to something like the statistical uh, you know, uh, uh, change in um, the phase parameter. So if you have something like 10 to 15 parameters, um, you know, there's going to be just some uncertainty there. And if you look at sort of what signal to noise ratio you need to beat the statistical um, change in the, in, the, in the phase, then essentially you need a signal to noise ratio of about 30 or more, which kind of is very much in the ballpark of uh, GW170817. Uh, so with a single detector functioning right now, probably you need something um, like at the distance of 170817, like about, you know, tens of megaparsecs. Uh, but with the network, probably you, know, you could look at hundreds of megaparsecs and achieve sort of the same signal to noise. So um, the hope is there that hopefully we'll be able to, to kind of detect G modes at some point. But again, like Paul, I would not bet um, any part of my house on it anytime soon. Uh, so I'll conclude here. Um, of course, I realized I went through pretty fast, but uh, hopefully I've sort of made the point that non-radial modes of compact stars can carry imprints of the phase of matter. Uh, it's important to kind of quantify these, determine their resonant excitation frequencies, um, as well as their um, damping times and so forth, and do it for a range of oscillation modes. Um, G modes in particular are sensitive to stratification. Uh, they can tell you whether you have a mixed phase or not. Uh, they've already been studied um, in, for the crust of neutron stars. The G modes have different frequencies based on what the composition of the, the interior of the crust is, uh, what the dominant nucleus is. Uh, and the crustal G modes are actually quite distinct from the core G modes. Uh, so I think the oscillation modes are, are as are more sensitive to composition than um, things like the tidal polarizability, but it's a lot harder to, it's going to be a lot harder to find these modes. So many continuous wave sources or, um, you know, just sheer luck where you have an event where um, 
these modes are excited to a strong amplitude. And we don't really know uh, what those amplitudes are. Uh, we, the only way to address that is probably to numerical relativity that studies initial conditions and so on. So um, that might be a while before we know how strong these modes are. Uh, nevertheless, the detection of oscillation modes I think is worth pursuing because it's one of the few ways one can answer the question about what's inside a neutron star. In other words, really determine the composition. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for attending this talk and I'll be happy to take any questions now. Thanks. Thank you, Prasant. This was a really intriguing uh, talk. We have quite a couple of uh, questions uh, from the viewers. Uh, the first one is, um, uh, see, this is a general question, I think, from Shakshi Shukla. Mass radius relation is same for all neutron stars? Uh, there's a unique mass radius relation, yes. Uh, for yeah, so if you talk about neutron star, I mean, unless one talks about different, um, yeah. So any, you know, at any um, certain composition, you're going to have a certain mass and a radius, and so you know, there's a unique curve somewhere. Uh, whether that curve is sort of just one branch, or whether it it sort of uh, you know has a phase transition and then softens at some point, or uh, has a twin branch. I mean, these things are you know up for discussion, but essentially. Yeah, if you, you know, uh, I mean, you would need, so the, from the perspective of the TOV equation, I mean, you know, the question means, you know, can you invert um, the TOV equation? So if you knew a whole bunch of mass and radii, would I be able to find a unique, um, uh, you know, pressure energy curve? And yes, the answer is yes. Okay, so now we come to some uh, uh, other question. This is from Arunabh Mukherjee. So this is very exciting from the CW signal detection perspective for an isolated neutron star. However, do we have a ballpark estimate of the GW amplitude? Um, I think the most optimistic ones that I've seen are something about, you know, with a, with a strain of about 10 minus 23. Um, and that, but the thing is the estimates have been going down as people uh, make more serious calculations. So I've seen long ago, it was something like 10 minus 21. This was even before, uh, you know, LIGO came online. Uh, and then once start, people started to sort of look at, um, I think do more sort of numerical relativity uh, simulations, they saw that um, these modes really, you know, don't survive very long or they uh, often split into daughter modes. There's avoided crossings because uh, as you can see the G mode, once it gets up to, uh, you know, kilohertz or more, will start hitting possibly the F modes and then, then you should see some avoided crossings and so on. Um, so the energy that's bumped into these modes um, determines what the gravitational wave signal should be. Um, and so there may be you know, certain kinds of mergers, maybe more eccentric ones are able to transfer more energy from the orbital dynamics to the, to the mode. Um, but, you know, probably 10 minus 23 is the most optimistic that I've seen right now. So that's kind of at the low end of the sensitivity curve. Uh, but, you know, most papers that I've seen now are still optimistic in the sense that when you look at, um, you know, 3G net, uh, three, not 3G networks, but 3G detectors, uh, third generation detectors, um, that you will be able to uh, have a better shot at detecting these things. But yeah, right now it's probably not over the sensitivity. Thanks, next one is from Devaroti. Are the parameters of the quark model quark matter model precise enough to distinguish between nuclear matter or quark matter equation of state using GW frequencies? Um, the, well, okay, so I don't think you can answer that question very well. So at least for the, oh, so at least for the model that I chose, I think the VBAC model, yeah, we haven't really uh, looked at that, um, where the gravitational waves can, can give a difference. Um, we did do some, some, um, yeah, we had a proceedings article. I'm trying to remember what the, uh, conclusion of that was. So we did look at, I think we just looked at consistency. So we, we looked at these VBAC model, uh, parameters, uh, where, you know, the, it camouflaged the phase transition and we looked at, 
the tidal polarizability and uh, yeah, it, it couldn't really distinguish between that. So I, I think that was what kind of drove me to look more into these oscillations. Yeah. Okay. So next one is from Rana, Rana Nandi. For Maxwell's construction, there is no fixed mixed phase. Mm -hmm. So is there any signature of phase transition in G mode in that case? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, yeah, of course, the difference between Maxwell and, and Gibbs is uh, based on your assumptions. So if you assume the surface tension of quark matter is small, then, you know, you can have, have a sort of a Gibbs phase. But if you assume that it's large or sufficiently large, then you'll have some, uh, you'll have a Maxwell construction or you have some, uh, you have another boundary, a sharp boundary. So in that case, uh, we have not done the study, the, but it can be done. So essentially one has to introduce an additional you know, boundary condition uh, and see what happens to the G mode. So I think it's worth keep, I, my feeling is it will still be there because even um, in the case of uh, the Gibbs construction, I mean, it's, it's not that um, there's a sharp, dis, it's not like there's a sharp discontinuity. It's really uh, that the scale over which the sound speed is changing is, is uh, you know, much faster than anything else. So I think um, if you have sort of a, a very sharp um, surf, I mean, sharp demarcation as a result of the Maxwell construction, it may sort of suppress the G mode, but I don't think that's really the case inside a neutron star. I, I don't, I mean, it's a, it's a construction, but I don't think that that's really what is going on inside a neutron star, that you have these kind of sharp uh, changes from one phase to the other. So um, I have a technical question. So yeah. you have a five PDS partial a partial differential equation that you solve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, now my question is, how do you distinguish between the F mode and the G modes? Like they are the same equations, right? You are solving, but the, yeah, mm -hmm. but the omegas are different. That's right. So you would have to scan the omega space to see where you get solutions. So the F modes typically would, um, you'd get them between about one and a half. So one and a half to about three kilohertz, uh, because it depends on the restoring force. So, uh, you know, if you think of restore the origin of the restoring force being different, that's going to basically tell you what the frequency is. So you'll get a certain frequency of, for F modes. Uh, if you get, a, if you solve the same equation, you get, uh, and you look in the omega space, let's say between one and a half and three kilohertz, if you find a solution there, those are likely F modes. If you look in a different frequency regime lower, uh, then those are going to be G modes. If you look at, you know, six to 10 kilohertz, you'll find solutions there also, which are P modes. Um, yeah, so it's the same equation, but then um, you get several solutions. But I guess there is an uh, imaginary part of uh, to that omega term for- That's right, mode, yeah. Which is not yes, there is. Correct. Right. Uh, the, yeah, I've not calculated that. That's, but you're correct. There should be, oh. and that should, uh, yeah. So I didn't calculate the, um, yeah. So the G modes themselves are actually not calculated with the formalism that I described. The F modes are. Um, so I've not calculated the damping times from there. I calculate the damping times more by doing some kind of heuristic calculation where I assume a certain energy uh, of the mode and then um, a certain rate of energy loss. I just divide one by the other. But uh, you are right that essentially one should do a full, full blown GR calculation to determine the damping time. Okay. So here is a uh, comment from Debaruti in this um, regard. She says that mm -hmm. in the Cowling approximation, the frequency solutions are real. Yeah, I don't use the uh, right. So for the F modes that I showed, I don't use the Cowling approximation. Um, and but I didn't show the damping time. I have calculated that as well. For the G modes, uh, they are in the cowling approximation. And so all I have are the real frequencies. But yeah, she's correct. So the next question is from Manu. The F mode smoking gun that you mentioned needs an independent measurement of the mass. So she writes, it doesn't work for a two solar mass neutron star, right? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. So one would need an independent measurement of the mass of the F modes, which is again, another reason why for G modes, you don't. Uh, if you just find a G mode frequency that's, um, you know, close to one kilohertz, uh, you cannot have any neutron star that gives you a G mode that's that high. And the quark star is even below that. So then it has to be a hybrid star. So she writes, if detected, how could you distinguish 
F mode and G modes from the GW data? Um, you have already uh, <laughs> answered this. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I think, I mean, to be, I'm really not that, an ex that much an expert on, on, you know, how it might be analyzed from the data. I mean, it, it involves a lot of uh, this business of, you know, Bayesian inferences and things which I um, have never done. So I don't know really looking at honestly at the data, how one would distinguish one mode from the other. Uh, all I can say from my theoretical work is that uh, the frequencies are just very different. So, you know, maybe like a post-merger uh, oscillation, uh, we can determine whether it's an F and a G mode just based on the frequency difference. Because yeah, the G mode probably would still be under one kilohertz no matter where it came from, whereas the F mode has sort of a, seems to have a lower bound of about one and a half. Okay, thanks. Next question is from Ritam. Uh, for sure, discontinuity shocks can generate. What will the signature be then? Um, so I'm not sure if he means the signature on the uh, oscillation modes. Uh, presumably, yeah, I, I think it's, it's worth studying that. We do have in mind at least to get to those kind of studies eventually. I mean, the next step is probably to look at um, something like proto-neutron stars, you know, include high temperature, um, and then probably move on to shocks uh, and to see what will happen then to the oscillation modes. I would, I would guess that's going to be a, a quite a difficult problem, yeah. Yeah, I don't have a clear answer to that. But. So I don't see any more questions from uh, the audience. So let me thank Prasan for this uh, very nice talk.